Welcome to the Lover's Lounge podcast, where we talk to experts and other guests on topics related to love, relationships, and sex. I'm your host, Tina Love, and on this episode, we have Mal Harrison. She is a clinical sexologist, eroticism philosopher, TEDx speaker, member of the International Society for Sexual Medicine, and the executive director of the Center for Erotic Intelligence. Welcome to the show, Mal. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I am so excited to talk with you. I know that um, we're going to help some folks out on this episode, girl. We're going to help some people out, (laughs) right? So men, yes, 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 yes. So men, (laughs) ladies, sit down, sit back. Let's relax and get comfortable here in the Lover's Lounge because Mal is going to educate us on a lot of things erotic. So, um, but before we do, before we get fully into this, I'd like to know, Mal, how you landed in such a role as a clinical sexologist. That's a a good, juicy question. Mm -hmm. Um, I think think there are a lot of steps on the staircase um, for all of us in terms of how we wind up where we wind up. But uh, for me, I guess it kind of began growing up in a household um, where sex is always a very comfortable topic. Um, growing up on the fridge, there was a magnet and it was like a 1950s cartoon of a mom holding a pie and a little speech balloon that said, darling, God's gift to women wasn't men. It was the shower massager. Okay. So... <laughs> So I kind of had a clue that there was hmm. something fun going on. And um, and and so my m- mother and grandmother, I think I come from kind of a long line of Aramis or horny women, just to be frank. And, um, and so they, you know, dinner was filled with innuendo. And obviously, I didn't get a lot of it when I was younger. But right. as I grew up, I realized you know, sexuality or something fun and playful and, you, you know, in your teen years, you get to where you're like, oh, I don't want to hear that, guys. Like, don't, don't say that stuff. But it was never, it was never difficult to discuss. If I had questions, they were always answered. Um, my mom uh, encouraged masturbation from a young age. She was like, you know, figure out your body. Don't risk an STI or pregnancy with a partner until you figure out how to get yourself off first, which I to this day share with um, with people, and they think, "Oh, yeah, that's actually a good point." So yeah. <laughs> um, so then from there, I I went on to um, to college, and I was studying psychology, and also I had a scholarship um, for classical voice, so I was really into opera. And at that point, my parents had divorced, and I was watching both of them make these absolutely horrific relationship places and um and so as I was kind of getting into this opera thing like all the operas and stories are these tragedies over um you know love people are killing for love people are dying for love and even less and I just thought you know my mom's making these bad relationship choices and I'm seeing like the smartest woman I know just do really dumb stuff. Can I curse? Because I curse a lot. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, she, well, uh, dumb stuff. We'll we'll keep it there. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, fine. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, and so I just I was kind of suddenly driven by what is this this thing that drives people mad? Yeah. And um, and so I knew I had to kind of wrap my head around this. Um, because, you know, it's this driver that's causing all of us to, to do these things and how does it affect our brain? And so fast forward a few years later, after I come out of undergrad, um, I was amidst my own horrible relationship decision, something I said I would never do. Right. Um, and I was, I was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Wow. And so what I realized through that process was that OBGYNs are not taught to deal with sexual issues, um, especially female sexual function. Um, in fact, a recent study showed that the majority of them have on average about four to six hours of training on sexual function and health. Wow. So, and they have no training when it comes to psychological issues, unless, of course, they've also studied psychology, which most of them have not. 
Um, so if somebody goes to them and they, they have issues with trauma or triggers with trauma, even just for an exam, you know, this can be a major uh, impetus for people getting regular health checks. And then, you know, sex therapists, on the other hand, have no medical training when it comes to medicine. So I realized I really wanted to become a clinical sexologist, sexologist to bridge the gap between medicine and therapy. And so that's, that's how I that's started how doing one. I'm, yeah. Interesting, <laughs> interesting story. And you've said a lot. So you talk about, um, you talked about your childhood and hats off to your mom uh, that she was very sex positive and didn't really make you feel like, you know, to talk about sex or your body or any of those things was like taboo because, you know, um, that's not everybody's experience. I mean, many people have grown up and they've kind of felt like, well, you know, they should be ashamed of their body or they shouldn't, you know, touch themselves or, you know, whatever, because maybe they did. And all of a sudden they got, you know, don't do that, you know, and uh, then they thought, well, okay, this must be wrong. And so, um, so hats off to her that she just kind of made it where it's something that you could talk about. And you didn't feel like you needed to learn elsewhere. So great, great job to her. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And I mean, just these, these barriers of shame that so many people experience with you know, don't do that, or even, you know, our religious background, cultural background, like sex is how we all got here, but then I think the majority of us are conditioned to believe that it's this bad, shameful, dirty thing separate from a part of who we are, and so that's that's a big part of my work is just trying to to resolve that and help yeah. people overcome some of those barriers. Some of that, yeah. And interestingly enough, there probably are some people that are listening that can totally relate uh, to what we're talking about. Maybe to this day, still, you know, um, having some angst or some, you know, just discomfort or just not really, you know, feeling at ease about talking about their body, maybe even touching their body, maybe you know, the, the issue of, of masturbation or having an orgasm and th those types of things could be very uncomfortable for some. And so, um, I'm, I'm very glad that you're doing the work that you're doing to help people get more in tune, you know, with their bodies and realizing that, you know, it's not something dirty, uh, or that, you know, it is their body and, um, that they should know their body. So we're going to talk more about this. Um, in fact, not long ago, um, we celebrated International Orgasm Day, right? In mm -hmm. Unbelievable, right? They have an International Orgasm Day where we celebrate, <laughs> yes, <laughs> orgasm, people, yeah, you know, so it's like, wow. Um, and, and we found that there's actually a huge orgasm gap between women and men. So, Mal, can you share exactly what we mean by this orgasm gap can you break this down sure um and you know it's so fascinating there are so many inequality gaps in society and this is, this is a part of our work that every single one of us must do at, as a part of social justice mm -hmm. um and so you know we talk about the pay gap we talk about the investment gap um and this is just one of these these gaps that happens to not be a thigh gap. Um, right. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the the why behind it is kind of like peeling layers of a never ending onion. So I'm just going to touch on a few of the, the important layers to give us some context and understanding. Right. And, um, and, and first off, oh, yeah. I want to I want to make sure that the audience knows exactly what we mean by this orgasm gap. First off, too, and then of course you'll get into the why. But there may be some people, interestingly enough, that don't really understand what we're talking about right now. So, what do we mean by by this orgasm gap between men and women? So, overall, in general, only about twenty five percent of women orgasm from uh, in the penetrative sex alone okay um so from vaginal intercourse and yet you know 99 percent of the guys i all talk to say they make their partners come like crazy every single time right um and you know i'm always giving them a side eye when, when i hear that mm -hmm. um yeah so so and so this percentage of of 75 percent of women not orgasming from vaginal sex 
this is, uh, you know, a combined average of multiple studies over the past 30 years. And so, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of whys behind that, but then we have this most recent study done by the Archives of Sexual um, Behavior, and they had a sample size of 52,000 people, which for sexuality studies is massive. You don't normally get that. Mm -hmm. um, and they asked, uh, respondents, how often do you orgasm when you're sexually intimate? So the question asked is really important because it's a bit different than the, the data of, you know, the 75% um, I presented before. So this is really, um, you know, it, this question didn't ask from penetrative sex alone or from penis and vagina intercourse. It simply just asked when you're sexually intimate. So this could be a broad range of activities with a partner or partners from oral sex to finishing with toys, et cetera. And this was men and, so and this, women, men and women, 52. This, yes. Okay. Yep. 52,000 men and women, um, all of uh, orientations, including heterosexual, gay, bi, lesbian um, included. Okay. And all right. so the, the study breaks down the rate of orgasm um, with heterosexual men reporting that they order them 95% of the time. Right. Gay, gay men come in at 89%. Mm -hmm. Bi, bi men come in at 88%. Bi men, bisexual men. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And then interestingly enough, lesbian women clock in at 86%. Mm -hmm. And then we see a drop to bisexual women, 66%, and then heterosexual women, 65%. Okay. So, I mean, to me, this is progress because we've gone from, you know, such a, a low percentage with all of these other studies um, to a higher percentage when we include, you know, any type of, when we broaden our ideas of sex, you know, if we oral sex, et cetera, like I mentioned before. Right. Um, but if we just look at the rate between heterosexual men and heterosexual women, wow. we're looking at. 65% versus 95%. Huge gap. And so there it is. Yeah. Huge, yeah. And the 86% of orgasm reported by lesbian women kind of proves it's not like it's the female anatomy that's the sole cause of this gap. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so if we look at the layers of the onion and we just have some real talk about why this happens, um, one thing listeners can do is visit uh, our website, Center for Erotic Intelligence.org, and there's a post called The Clit Disco, and this illustrates um, how penetration just doesn't exactly touch the glands clitoris. The glands clitoris is the external part of the clitoris, what most people think of as the clitoris. Um, and a lot of people don't know that the majority of this organ is uh, internal. But the part we can see is the glands, and that's the part that, um, that so many of us women stimulated in order to reach orgasm. Right. Um, so, so it's, you know, it's, it's not getting stimulated when a penis goes inside of it. It's just missing it. Unless, of course, we learn how to position ourselves and get in different angles, or we use, let's say, a vibrating ring and we're on top of our partner or we use a toy while we're having penetrative sex or our hands, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, there, there are definitely ways to, to incorporate um, new methodologies, but the stuff we're seeing in mainstream porn and the way we're kind of taught that like, you know, this jackhammer style of sex is supposed to be happening. That's not necessarily the key. Exactly. Thing. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And and it's unfortunate um, because that kind of, you know, if you're watching that, many people kind of make that look as though it's the norm, right? And it's in, it's not totally. at all, at, at all the norm. And so people's stereotypes or thoughts about sex and what, you know, what's expected, uh, unfortunately, can be sort of built around this, you know, what they're seeing. And it's like, no, they're acting. You know what I'm saying? You know. Yeah, totally. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And and then in society, you know, when we talk about sex with our, our friends or just in general in society, 
you kind of have two negotiations around it and it's either hiding it or bragging about it. Right. And so, um, and so I think that's, that's a part of our, our cultural context that makes it a problem because then when we're with our partners, it is hard to communicate our needs. It is hard to have these conversations because they're not normalized mm-hmm. in our everyday conversations with our friends. One of the greatest things we can do is just, you know, your podcast. That the work you're doing and having these conversations thank that you. is part yeah. of the work yeah thank you um and then also you know it boils down to a lack of equality and rights historically and women to maintain their safety so you know it's this this irony that we have this conditioning to protect the male ego we're taught that you know men are strong and fierce and they're there to protect us and then yet we throw our pleasure under the bus and sacrifice it all to protect their ego. Because we don't want to hurt um, their feelings. We don't want to hurt their feelings. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and it did really, you know, that obviously this has been happening for hundreds of years, but I would say the story of Sigmund Freud is one that I, I would say he is probably the biggest clit blocker of all time okay, yeah. for female pleasure. Um in 1905, he published the three essays on the theory of sexuality. Mm-hmm. And so here he differentiated between clitoral and vaginal orgasms and graded clitoral orgasms and the women who had them to be immature and infantile. Women, so, women who do not have them or women who do have them? Women who do. So essentially, if you have a clitoral orgasm, which is what we all have in yes. these, um, then you're immature and infantile and essentially insinuating that women who have clitoral orgasms are mentally unfit. Mm. Um, and he would say only real mature women can have the penetrative vaginal orgasm. Okay. And so what's so interesting is that now, 100 plus years later, we've had science prove that all genital orgasms derive from the clitoris, whether internal or external. So, I mean, it's a total crock what we mm-hmm. tried to, to push in society. And like the content mills of, of blogs and pop mags that we have today, where we see these harmful prescriptive headlines that really make people question, you know, am I normal? What yes. am I doing wrong? Am I, you know, like a headline to 15 types of orgasms you should be having. I see that stuff all the time. Um, during Freud's day, there were pamphlets called marriage manuals, and they spread his mistaken ideas about, you know, the infantile immature clitoral orgasm into the households and minds of couples across the Western world. So if you think about that time in America, women couldn't vote, we couldn't own property, we couldn't inherit property if we weren't already married, we definitely couldn't have a bank account. So basically we had no rights in society unless we were married. And naturally as it would follow, any woman who wanted to maintain her marriage and her safety frankly, mm-hmm. or who didn't want her husband to throw her in an insane asylum back then, which happened in droves, would, of course, just fake it. So, And there were no laws against domestic violence back then. Right. Um, so Freud's misinformation alone likely led to trillions of fake orgasms for generations following, and we're just now kind of coming Breaking out of that. it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. so let me, let's back up, honey, and make sure... <laughs> I said that when we, I said at the beginning of the show, we were going to educate some people and this was going to be a brutal truth, but there's some good stuff that's going to come behind this. But first off, we have to make sure that we're clear that all of this has pretty much built up a situation where many women have felt as though they needed to, is what I'm hearing you say, Mal, they needed to fake it because of this, uh, you know, saying that, okay, if you didn't, then there's something wrong with you. I mean, there have been literally women I've heard that, you know, thought that their vagina was broken or, you know, there's something wrong with me because I'm not able to do this. And they were very embarrassed and ashamed. And so in order to not feel that way, if this was the norm and this is what I'm supposed to be feeling, then I'm going to fake it so that I can be a part of the norm. Is that really what you're saying, Mal? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, also, like, as women, we're we're taught, like, oh, I'm going to get a man, I'm going to keep a man, you know, my pussy is yanking, 
I've got the good shit. I've got, you know, like all of this stuff yes. is kind of, it's, it's kind of, um, inter, it's like a lot of people use the word toxic masculinity, but yeah. I think we as, as women take that on as well and sort of perpetuate in some ways the toxic femininity, um, of, you know, pow- and there is empowerment and power through sex, but, you know, if we're not speaking our truths and we're not speaking up, the same way we need to go in that boardroom and demand a raise and speak up and say, hey, I deserve this, Mm -hmm. is the same way we need to speak up for our pleasure. And no, nothing is wrong with anybody if they can't have an orgasm from penetrative sex. And by the way, the average time it takes a woman to have an orgasm from uh, just in general is longer than... Yeah, tell it, girl. <laughs> it's, Go it's, on. It's, it's longer than the average time it takes size. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we need to, to really buckle up and muster up the courage to speak our truth and speak up. Because when we value our pleasure, we, we stand for our self-worth and we value our self-worth. So if he finishes, you know, on average, it's around five to six minutes. Right. If he finishes then, you know, for some, it's a lot sooner than that. That's okay. Nothing's wrong with anybody, you know. But what he could do if he were a gentleman is he could say, all right, I'm going to finish you off with my mouth or my hands or we're going to use this toy. Or she could speak up and say, you know what, you're going to get me off first, ladies, freaking first. You're going to get me off and then you can do, uh, do whatever you want and, and, you know, ha- have, have fun, have, have at it. Right. Um, or she can say, you finished first and you know what? I want you to go down on me now or I want you to, you know, whatever your preferred method of getting off would be. But, um, but, you know, we, we have to speak up and, um, and, and, and we just, we have to. And I think there's so much about speaking up, not just in the bedroom. Or in the boardroom, but like for, for simple things, like when our partners say, what do you want for dinner tonight? And as women, we're just like, oh, whatever you want, babe, you pick, I don't care. You know, we're, we're really conditioned to just, you know, Kinda give, flow, give, give. Yeah. 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 And, and not to say we, we should never do that, you know, but it's like, girls, we got to speak up. We That's have to, right. to do what we want. We have to make a practice of defining and identifying our own wants and needs from things as small as what we want for dinner to, you know, getting an equal pay as the same guy who does the same job as us and to having orgasmic equality. So just, so I think we yeah, just keep it real. Yeah. Yeah. Just as I, I like to say, when you spread your legs, don't spread fake news. And that's, that's the truth. <laughs> Please stop the fake news. Yes, exactly. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, it, because it's really kind of sad, you know, um, I can see where, you know, women could possibly feel like, well, I need to just hurry on up because this person's, you know, five, six minutes and they're there. And so what's wrong with me? So let me just go ahead and act like it happened with me, too, so that, you know. I feel like I'm everything's okay, you know, or he feels okay, you know what I mean? But we have to stop the fake news is what I'm hearing from Mal right now. And, um, you know, kind of have some conversation, take a step back and discuss, you know, what possibly can be done so that both of us are reaching where we want to reach. Is that what I'm hearing, Mal? And, and yeah, and it's, it's also for the sisterhood. I mean, when we take it with one lover, then he's going to go out there when we break up and we're not with him anymore. He's going to think, I'm, I'm the Don Juan. I, you know, that's the 99% of guys who claim right. to make their partners come every time. You know, we're, we're at fault when we don't yep. speak up and we don't communicate and we're starting these relationships off in a dishonest manner. Yeah. You know, and, and part of that's also our conditioning. It's like, we want someone to like us. We want to have a relationship and we're, we're having sex and really into sex. And, you know, maybe we're not having orgasms, but in some ways we're putting on a performance in hopes that we can get a man and lock a man. And we're not being honest with him or ourselves. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's, we don't have time for that anymore in society. Okay. We are grown ass women. It All is right. time to, to woman up. Yeah. What a disservice. 
what did this service yes. do? You know, I'm just thinking, you know, you got this person walking away and, and he's, you know, feeling like, oh, yes, I put it down, you know, like I'm just, <laughs> yes, you know, uh, and maybe he's fine. He's fine. And everything's fine. But at the same time, he's kind of got a thought in his mind that, you know, you've been reaching this point and you really haven't. And so now that's kind of giving him a false sense of, you know, whatever. Um so yeah, it's a disservice to him and it's a disservice to you because at the end of the day, you're not really. So yeah. Wow. Totally. Yeah. So now you mentioned earlier that there are some things that can be used uh, during sex to help with that direct stimulation to the clitoris so that it, 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 it increases uh, the chances of reaching an orgasm during uh during sex. So let's talk about some of those sex toys. You mentioned uh, cock ring, I, be- I believe you said. Yeah, cock rings are great. Um, and for uh, for experiencing an orgasm during penetration, mm-hmm. um, women on top with the cock ring, um, some of them have little vibrators, so they'll be positioned on top of the cock. So as you're riding on your partner, you're your external clitoris is directly hitting the vib- vibrator part of the cock ring. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of my personal favorites. Yeah. Um, uh, and then any type of uh, toy that that you could use at the same time or your hands. Um, game products make a really cool hands-free toy that you can put um, between you and your partner in lots of different positions. And it actually was designed with the internal clitoris in mind. So it's got these two legs that kind of fit uh, on either side of um, where the clitoral bulbs lie, which is underneath our lip. Okay. Um, and then it, it has kind of a bulb, a bulb uh, figure that, that stimulates the clitoris. So that toy by Dane is very, very um, useful. And then the thing that I love so much for my female clients who I talk to who have never been able to even have an orgasm from sex or otherwise, Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. which surprisingly I see a lot of of women who experience this. Um, And yes, it's part conditioning and shame and, um, and, you know, they've never been encouraged to explore their bodies or they have a lot of, um, I mean, there's just been so much mutilation for right, right. like you as women in general. That could be getting um, in the way. Yeah, exactly. That could be getting totally. in the way. Totally. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I work on a lot of that stuff with them. But one thing that has just been riveting for mm-hmm. me to see as a success has been the use of these oscillators. And oscillators. So, um, oscillators, she said. Yeah. Okay. So you... You can get them from Satisfier, um, is a company that makes them. And then uh, I'm not a huge fan of the name, but Womanizer is also a, a company that makes them. Um, I'm a huge fan of Satisfier. They have wonderful, a wonderful range. They have toys for couples. Um, but they have a, a great price point, which I think makes, makes these toys also more equitable because a lot of these toys out there are like 50 bucks break after a while um but satisfier uses uh silicone which is something you know a body safe material that you want to be using not just plastic stuff you know off of amazon per right. se. um and these oscillators instead of you know vibrators are usually phallic they penetrate they vibrate the oscillators produce a type of vibration too but they mimic sucking so they're air oh, pulsators okay and so yeah, so they mimic oral sex, um, and I cannot tell you how many clients I've had have their first orgasm from Satisfier or or one of these types of uh, toys. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's it's and personally, like I'm like, wow, these are amazing. I you know um, what I've heard <laughs> about those. Uh, it was maybe about a couple years ago I saw. Uh, that they brought this out and it was maybe at a sex tech conference or something or a fair and they were actually showing it and uh, showing how it works and everything. Well, not literally showing how it works, but they were explaining (laughs) (laughs) and, uh, and the, but there were women who had used it and they were just 
they were getting rave reviews. And I was like, okay, yeah. So, yeah, neat. All right, Ashley. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they're, um, they're also just really cute devices. And so I, I would say, like, if you're a mom or you have kids or nieces and nephews around and, like, your kids found one of these, they look like a skincare device. Ah. So, so they're, like, <laughs> kind of safe to have just hanging out like obviously you don't want to be touching your bits and having having your kid grab it but you know if they were pilfering and in your drawers and they found it it, you wouldn't be explaining why you had like a big old dildo in there you know it's like oh it's just just mommy's skincare device you know (laughs) (laughs) yeah she's taking care all right yes all right yeah (laughs) (laughs) now there's something else i think i heard about um there's like something that you can put on your finger. There's maybe some kind of, is there a finger vibrator sort of thing that you can put on your finger? I thought I heard about something like that. Yeah. So Dame, actually the same one who I mentioned before that has the hands-free vibrator. Yeah. Um, they also make a finger. It's like, just like a little instrument. So one is called Eva and one is called the spin. Um, Eva is the hands-free vibrator that you can use during sex. And then I think, um, I think it's called Ben, um, is the, the toy for, yeah, it is. I just looked it up. Say the um, name again. The, if you'll say the name again. Yeah, it's Finn, F-I-N. Okay. Um, and this is just a, a, a toy that you put on your finger and I mean you can use you can get as creative as you want like not just on the clearest you could, if your your man likes it up under his balls if somebody likes it on the nipples you know people people love using these finger vibrators in all sorts of ways I've actually used it when I had a bad sinus infection between my eyebrows wow <laughs> me. yeah not this particular toy but uh, uh the flower vibrator by satisfier it has like these four pedals and i i put it on my nasal bridge uh like all four pedals around it and i mean i was so sick and it did wonders so my you goodness. can get really creative multi-usage <laughs> all right yes okay okay yeah yeah all right well that's good i'm glad that we have just broken all of this down not to make anybody feel bad or anything, but we really want to help make you feel better is what we're doing is, is yes. just, just exposing truth and helping us have, you know, more meaningful and wonderful orgasms and experiences with our spouse and, or our mate. So, you know, that's basically what we're doing. And you are actually the executive director for the center for erotic intelligence so can you first off tell us what the center does? Yeah. Um, so the center started off really as um, an education-based company. We wanted to get sex ed out um, in a huge way to middle school and high school students and found that to be such a challenge. Um, And so we were able to create erotic intelligence education and um, and implement it in colleges and universities. So um, Obama, uh, miss him, wish he were back, but uh, but he implemented uh, a rule that every publicly funded college and university had to have some form of consent education on campus because sexual assault was so right on campus. And so... I saw an opportunity to, to put our foot in the door um, when, you know, getting school districts and school boards around the country to, to try to put erotic intelligence education in middle high school. Clearly a very, very huge task that was not going to be the way I wanted. Okay. And so um, how was and, your, let me just ask, um, you wanted to get this into high schools is what I'm hearing. So what, correct. Was, what was your experience with that? Was it difficult? Um, please share. So difficult, so difficult. So only 28 states currently in the U.S. mandate um, sex and or HIV education. And of those 28 states, only 17 require the education to be medically and scientifically accurate. So, you know, we were talking about unpacking cultural and, um, and, you know, all these sorts of influences that 
shape our sexuality um, and our, our beliefs around sex. But now we've got, you know, we've got these states that allow misinformation to be taught to kids about sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the stories that I've heard are just horrific. Um, teachers, one, one of the most common stories uh, is the one of tape. Teachers will tell students to take a piece of tape, put it on their arm, take it off, put it back on their arm. Every time the tape loses its stickiness. And the metaphor they make is, oh, well, every time you have sex, your vagina gets looser. And that is just absolute oh bullshit. Oh <laughs> it is, it's not true. And it's my response is, so you're telling me that if I have sex 50 different times with 50 different men, I'm going to have a loose vagina, but I can have sex with my partner 50 times and my vagina is not going to be any looser? Like, it makes no sense. Oh um, and scientifically, you're not going to have a loose vagina every single time you have sex. It, it, it's, it's not how it works. Wow. Um, our vaginas are, are made to take a pounding and push babies out. They rebuild their collagen and elasticity. So, you know, it's not until we, we unless we've had, you know, six or seven kids or we go through menopause, et cetera, et cetera, then we start seeing, you know, the changes. Um, yeah. Integ yeah, the integrity of our vaginal walls, the, the dryness, and there are remedies for that as well. And that's like a whole other aspect of female sexuality we don't talk about is, right. is aging and menopause but but that's a whole other topic but um but yeah so there's just so much rife misinformation around sexuality and um and abstinence only I mean we've had from the Waxman report to the Guttmacher Institute we have proof in the pudding that abstinence only sex ed does not work it actually um, does nothing to curtail teens from not having sex at an earlier age. Right. And we have the data to prove it. And I, yet I, our yes. country, is, it, we're still investing millions of dollars into abstinence only sex ed. And, and actually, it's, it's yeah, a, yeah, and actually the, the data <laughs> supports that it actually creates the opposite of what we're thinking that we're achieving by doing abstinence education. Uh, we're thinking Correct. that by doing abstinence education, we are... Uh, you know, discouraging teens from having sex and that there'll be less teenage pregnancies when actually the opposite is occurring. Uh, in other countries, they are much more forthcoming uh, in sex education and their numbers are the opposite of ours, that actually teens are not indulging in as much sex or having teenage pregnancies. Is that, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Spot on. Um, you know, even though America has continued to have declining rates of teen STI and pregnancy, we still have the highest rate of teen pregnancy and STI right. of any industrialized nation. So, I mean, clearly it's not working. In the Netherlands, um, they uh, introduced uh, sex ed as in his kindergarten. And when I say that, I think a lot of people might, you know, for a lot of people, oh my God, sex ed to kindergartners. But they're not teaching penis and vagina or right, right. sexual, you know, they're not teaching, what they're teaching are relationship skills and ideas around consent. So what they're saying is, you know, how do you feel when you hug, hug someone you love? How, who do you want to hug in the class right now? Do you want to ask them if you can give them a hug? How does it make you, you know, it's really emotional intelligence. And yes. that, that's a big part of, of what our erotic intelligence education uh, entails. And it's what makes it different from what most people think of when they think of uh, modern day sex ed. Um, so we have five pillars. We, we had four for the past uh, three years. And just this past year, we introduced the fifth. Um, and so the, the five pillars are um, consent education, because we need that now, obviously, sexual and reproductive health, which is what we think of when we think of sex education. Um, and then we have uh, relationship education. About 70% of that pillar is social and emotional intelligence development, which has been uh, just absolutely amazing to hear feedback from students who say, oh, you know, that aspect of the program helped me deal with a conflict at work, or that helped me have a really tough conversation with my parents. So, you know, this is really, um, you know, how to be a good 
good human in the world in some sense. Okay. Um, okay. Or just how to, how to be a more self-aware human, I would say. Right. Um, and then we have digital literacy. And that's, that's a whole aspect of, you know, battling misinformation on the internet and also porn literacy. So really um, yes. understanding, you know, how some aspects of mainstream porn aren't necessarily real world. The norm. Yes. Yeah. So good. Yeah. And so the, yeah. Yes. So that's what we do. <laughs> very, very important because, you know, I can remember, oh gosh, um, when my son was, oh my gosh, he probably was seven or eight and he liked to play video games. And I, I think he wanted, he was interested in this, he had a Kindle or, you know, and the Kindle is basically just like an iPad today or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And he put in, he started putting in assassins, you know, he started trying to spell assassin, right? Well, the first three letters of assassin is A-S-S, -S, of course. And <laughs> suddenly he saw more than what he was bargaining for. He was not exactly looking for that. And, uh, but there it is. I mean, this was his introduction to seeing porn, really. Uh, all of a sudden he had some very graphic material that came across his computer and he's like mm. looked and he's like so shocked um but but at the end of the day you know our kids now you know with with the kindles and with the ipads and all this technology that they have at their fingertips they can at any time see some things that could be shocking and disturbing and if they're seeing the wrong thing it can start to sort of create this thought about what sex is you know and the last thing you want is for your son to see something like this and think, oh, so this is what you're supposed to do to women, you know, and it's like, right. oh, no, <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> you know, so that's that's why I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing is because you're educating youth about the fact that, uh, yeah, you may see this, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is what goes down here. You know what I'm saying? So I'm glad to hear you. Totally. Yeah. Very, very important work. It's, and it's, we've done some, um, some research, uh, just on our end on what, um, kids might see when they Google things like dick pic or mm -hmm. lesbian. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're getting there. And it's like when I was a kid, I looked up penis in the dictionary and giggle with my girlfriend. You know, I was like five or six. Like, oh my gosh, penis. Right. And like, so the digital version of that, they're getting hardcore pornography um, and they're getting their first notions of, yeah. of what sex is and what it means, and what it looks like Yes, from a lot of this hardcore pornography. And, you know, it's, it's tragic because these are their first sexual imprints of, yes. of life. And so these conversations really do have to start from a much younger age. I mean, they do need to start, you know, yeah. super young. And, and, you know, one thing parents always ask me, you know, how do I approach this with my kids? How do I have to talk? And I'm like, it's not a one-time talk anymore. The yes. birds and the bees is a, a lifetime conversation. And if they come to you with a question, always ask them, well, where did you hear that? Where did you see that? Um, and try to get some context around why they're asking the question they're asking before diving into a big long answer <laughs> it yeah. can be quite helpful right um but but yeah it's it's just so Im important to to have these conversations and 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 normalize it because if if it's normalized then they yes. don't think it's a big deal and they, they can come and ask you yes. questions about other stuff Absolutely. and you know you don't want them learning talking about this from their peers because we as adults have a lot more experience with sex and you know their friends their same age so you know we're the experts here so, the so yeah the information yeah exactly so it's very important yeah very very important so now um mal how can the listeners hear more from the center of erotic intelligence hear more from you maybe um you know see things that you've written or you know all of that yeah, so um, so you can go to centerforeroticintelligence.org. Um, there are, if you click the latest, um, you'll find uh, a couple of things written. A speech uh, I gave on you know, the crossroads of sex tech 
and erotic intelligence, you know, how technology is completely intersecting with human connection and how we can be smarter about the ways we utilize technology and the ways we may, might be afraid technology is impacting us and, and some some relief in learning that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily all bad. Um, and then there's an article on what intel, uh, erotic intelligence is. Um, I always explain it uh, as a, a hand. So there are four finger ingredients. They're creative imagination, social intelligence, emotional intelligence, body attunement, and then the thumb that really works with the other four fingers is what I like to call self-awareness on steroids. Um, and so, uh, so you can learn more about what erotic intelligence is there. Um, there's also a lot of information on the internal clitoris and diagrams, pictures, illustrations, um, as well as uh, something on what makes an erotic couple, about couples. And then um, uh, there's Instagram, which is at erotic intelligence. And then I have a personal website um, that is malharrison.com that people can go to. Um, I think it's actually still under construction. Uh, but it should be up by the end of this week. So malharrison.com, M-A-L-H-A. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and then I, if anybody has questions or they want advice, um, I answer emails from people, um, and I'll be publishing the answers on my personal website. So people can reach out to me, uh, mal, M-A-L, at centerforerotticintelligence.org. Okay. Um, and, and I'm, I'm available. I'm here to help anyone I can. <laughs> yeah. Men, listen up. Mal can give you some tips. She can let you know. And ladies and parents, you know, if you're just trying to really understand how you need to breach this subject, you know, uh, you know, how I have these ongoing talks with my teenager or with my child about, uh, yeah. you know, all of this. Mal can help you. All right. Well, thanks so much, Mal, for coming on and being a guest on the show. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. You too. Thank you so much, Tina. And um, and kudos to you for, for being a great mom and and having those talks with your son. That that's always makes my day to hear, oh, hear that. Oh, yes. So yes. See, makes me hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> my son has memories uh, that he'll never forget because of the talks that we've had. Let him <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Put it this way, he doesn't uh, need a banana today because of some of the talks I've had right now. But anyway. Yes, ma'am. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, listeners. I hope you all have enjoyed the show. Please don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, and or leave some comments on the show. You can also reach out to me by email at theloverslounge at yahoo.com with show ideas and etc. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Lover's Lounge podcast, where we talk to experts and other guests on topics related to love, relationships, and sex. I'm your host, Tina Love, and until next time, please, peace. And of course, don't you forget, love. Love.